Let's pray and then we'll get into the message. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us today to gather together in your presence for the purpose of worshiping you and speaking to you, experiencing your love and your power and your grace and listening to your word. I pray, dear God, that you would anoint me for this moment, uh, that my words would be your words, that my thoughts would be your thoughts, uh, that you would just saturate this moment in your Holy Spirit and you would speak to your precious people as much as your Holy Spirit is at work in me to bring the message. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in each of your precious people today uh, to receive what you have to say to them through the teaching of your word, through the preaching of your word, through the prayer, through the worship, through everything uh, that we experience here together today. We, we love to talk about you, Lord, but we love more to talk to you, to communicate with you. And so I pray that today, somehow, miraculously, that's exactly what we would experience. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to get back into the Matthew series today. We're dropping back into Matthew. It's been quite some time since we were in this series. We took a little, I don't know, three or four or five or six month break from our, our series. Um, as a refresher, uh, Matthew is the gospel that is written most from the Jewish perspective. And the theme, I would say, of this gospel, there could be many themes, but the primary theme of this gospel is the coming of the kingdom of God, the coming of the kingdom of heaven, written from a Jewish perspective because Israel considered itself uh, God's nation, his kingdom, um, an appendage of the great kingdom that exists from heaven. And so the message began at the beginning of the gospel with John the Baptist, the prophet to precede Jesus, where he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then in time, his ministry decreased and Jesus' ministry increased and Jesus picked up the same messaging and he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And of course, Jesus unpacked that even more through sermons like the Sermon on the Mount, through parables in so many different ways and so many different examples and so many different sermons and so many different things that he did to show that the kingdom of heaven wasn't just near, it was here and that he was the king of that kingdom. And there was good news. This was good news. It wasn't bad news. You might think that it's bad news that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is near because the kingdom of God is holy and we are an unholy people. And so you would think the coming of that kingdom with all of its power and all of its authority would work against us rather than for us. But the good news of the gospel is for those who repent and place their faith in Jesus Christ, then the power and the authority of that kingdom is near, is here to work for us rather than against us. When Jesus would preach, of course, signs and wonders would follow, and the signs and wonders that followed were always good things. They were never bad things. Jesus was um, sometimes severe, but he was often loving and very merciful, and he showed how much the Father loved his children uh, through his miracles. We pick it up in Matthew chapter 11 today, and this is a uh, section that features both John the Baptist and Jesus, and Jesus using John the Baptist to make some incredible statements, not just about him, but about us as well. Beginning in uh, Matthew chapter 11, uh, verse 1, it says this. It says, after Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, and in chapter 10, you may remember this from a year or two ago when we were in it, um, in chapter 10, he had just sent the 12 out to do what he basically had done before them, to preach the same message with signs and wonders following, and he sent them out in twos, and so he was multiplying his effect by seven. He was maybe at the same time preparing them for future ministry and multiplying his ministry to Israel. So he was getting around the country times seven rather than by himself, and so he sent them out in, in six teams, and then... Uh, he himself went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? So John the Baptist came first, and his ministry was very powerful and very effective. He was, he was quite an anointed man of God. And he was out in the wilderness, and John was kind of an ascetic. Um, he was like the scribes that lived in a part of Israel that was very barren, the part of the Jordan River that um, is really close to Syria today where there's not a lot of growth. It's, it's just kind of a barren 
um, wilderness in that place. And so he was out in this place by the Jordan River, a very muddy, unappealing river because we've been there and we've seen it. And uh, he wasn't well-dressed and he wasn't necessarily even well-spoken, very eloquent or anything like that. And yet people were drawn to him. And when he would speak, he was so anointed, they would be cut to the heart and they would repent. They would confess their sins with a heart towards repentance, turning away from them. They would be baptized in the Jordan River, not the baptism that we experience, where we're baptized into the death of Christ and raised up into new life. This was a baptism as a consecration, as a preparation to make their hearts sensitive and their eyes open to receive the greater one that was about to come. And so he had this very, very powerful ministry, and it it was going incredibly well, and a lot of people were being drawn to him. And and he was the prophet to precede Christ so that when he came, there would be a people, a group of people prepared to receive him, sensitive to receive him. It's kind of like we send the worship team out first to prepare your hearts to receive God's word. The prophet preceded Jesus to prepare their hearts to receive the Messiah, not to be hard uh, or hardened and miss the incredible miracle that was going to stand right in front of them. Well, after Jesus took over um, and began to draw more people, of course, than John did, and even began to baptize more people uh, than John, um, his disciples, John's disciples, came back to him and said, what are we going to do? This guy's like out producing us. And John said, well, we're, he's the reason we came. And so he said, I must decrease and Jesus must increase. Well, at some point along the way, he dropped out of ministry completely. His time was up. And uh, like any good pastor, uh, he was, you know, arrested. And he was soon to be beheaded. And so he's in prison, and I'm uh, sure he knows that or has a sense that his life is probably not going to last much longer. Uh, He's offended some very, very powerful people through the teaching of God's word. And so at this moment, he's sitting in prison, and as faithful as he is, And as much as he understands the times and as clear as he was in his convictions that Christ was the Messiah, uh, he was having a moment, he was a human being, and he was having a moment of doubt, a dark night of the soul, you might say. And it's interesting to me that his greatest fear was not dying. His greatest fear was not accomplishing his purpose. He didn't send word to Jesus who was doing all these signs and all these wonders and all these miracles and ask him to help him get out of jail, to use his influence, to do a miracle, to do whatever. He simply asked his servants to go ask Jesus, are you really the Messiah? They're they're probably going to kill me any moment. And what I need to know is that I finished my work. And I think that is... Uh, quite laudable of John, even in that moment of doubt. And even though he should have had clarity, he was a human being, but his biggest concern was finishing uh, his father's work. Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. He went on to say, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. In another version it says, Blessed is anyone who is not offended because of me. And so he basically speaks back to John through his actions uh, according to prophecy in the Old Testament that is being fulfilled through him. In other words, everything he just said here was not just what he did, but was rephrased according to Isaiah and other Old Testament prophecies that said what would happen when the Messiah came. So he proved who he was to John through the scriptures. And it's as if he was saying to John, hey, John, you, you know the word and you perceive the time. You know the word and you perceive the time. So don't let this be a stumbling block to you. Uh, Perhaps John thought, as many Jewish people did, that when the Messiah would come, it would be much more triumphant, much more victorious. Maybe they thought that he was going to reestablish the kingdom of Israel immediately. Maybe they thought that people that were going to be loyal to him wouldn't suffer or be persecuted. They would actually be exalted to high places uh, in the kingdom, in his government. Maybe that was part of what was going on, or maybe it was just he was worried. So Jesus speaks to him and answers his question through his deeds. 
and through the scriptures. And indeed, these were unprecedented times. Uh, the 400 years before John the Baptist came were 400 years of darkness for Israel. There was no prophecy and no miracles in Israel that we can tell. It was a time after Malachi and before the coming of John the Baptist. They call it the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And there was nothing. It was spiritually dead. You still had the Bible and you still had Bible teachers. You had scribes, you had Pharisees, you had the high priest. You still had the religious uh, institution, but you didn't have the anointing. You didn't have the Holy Spirit, which may be why so many of those leaders, even when they were seemingly very, very accurate according to the scriptures, were way off from the heart of God. So there was a spiritually very, very dead and dry time. And then John the Baptist comes, and even though he didn't have power in the sense of doing miracles, he was incredibly anointed. And then after him came Jesus, who was obviously anointed, but also very, very powerful. And not only was he powerful and anointed, he was powerful and anointed like no one else in history. Even in the good old days of Samuel, and in the good old days of Isaiah and Jeremiah and some of the prophets that did extraordinary things, Elijah, Elisha, those were incredibly active ministries. They did so many powerful things. Nobody had ever been like Jesus. And so Jesus said, look, I'm fulfilling the scriptures, and the times are unprecedented, and I'm doing things in an unprecedented way. And he, and he pointed to, as I think he would point to today, the evidence in power of his ministry to affirm it. Now this is happening in front of an audience. This is happening in front of a crowd. And the way I imagine it is the crowd is confused. If this is the Messiah, which he seems to be, powerful in word, powerful in deed, then when is he going to usher in his kingdom and why are the people who are loyal to him, like John, in prison? They were probably confused. And so Jesus uses this as an opportunity to teach. It goes on to say, as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. And he said, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? And he's assuming that many in this crowd were actually touched by John's ministry before they were drawn to Jesus. And so uh, maybe he's not speaking to every single individual, but in jest, what did the people go out into the wilderness to see? Did they go out to see a reed swayed by the wind? There's some debate among people who write commentaries about what that means. It could mean just something about the landscape out there. Did you go out there to see you know, nature? And the answer would be no. It was a very barren place. Uh, it could be, did you go out there to see a, a weakling? Because John seems to be weak and in doubt now, and Jesus is kind of protecting his character. He's having a tough moment, but you know this is a courageous man. It could be that he's saying, you certainly didn't go out there to see a guy that would flatter you and tell you what your itching ears wanted to hear. You went out there to see someone that spoke on behalf of God. His ministry, he was an ascetic, and his ministry came with a lot of severity and a real emphasis on the holiness of God. And, of course, the need to repent, to get your heart right before God. So if not, uh, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? He, he dressed really poorly, apparently. He wasn't a celebrity. There was no performance, nothing to draw you in that regard. No, these, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. So, so what did you go out to see? Uh, then what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send a messenger ahead of you who will prepare a way before you, as if God is speaking through the prophet back to Jesus. This is in Malachi. It is also in Isaiah as a prophecy about the prophet that would precede the ministry of Jesus. And so Jesus said, you were drawn out into the wilderness to hear this guy who wasn't pleasant, who was severe, and emphasized the holiness of God, who offends everyone that he doesn't bless, that's what a preacher does, right? A good preacher offends you or blesses you, right? And sometimes offends you right up to the point where they bless you. Um, but they provoke you towards righteousness. That's what teaching and the preaching of God's word is. Don't tell me it's, it's something that should go down like sugar because it's not. Uh, the Bible describes God's word 
is uh, living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, and it's personally invasive, right? It lays everything bare before him to whom we must give an account. So it, sh it should be kind of an uncomfortable experience. So they went out there to this barren place, a long walk from Jerusalem, uh, to this muddy river to hear a guy that wasn't dressed well, probably wasn't eloquent in his words, didn't say nice and flattering things. And so why did you go there? You went out there because he was a prophet. And these people had never seen a prophet. And something about the way he spoke and when he spoke, the anointing that was upon him was extraordinary and drew them to him. And so Jesus is saying, if this guy is so great, then, then who does that make me? In Malachi, it's clear, and I would think many of them would have understood the teaching because the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin at that time that did the primary teaching in Israel, they taught in such a way as to prepare the people to receive the Messiah. Their, one of their biggest jobs was to recognize the coming of the Messiah. The fact that they failed at that job so miserably has got to be, I call it the great, greatest spiritual failure in the history of the world. The fact that the Sanhedrin, the high priests, and all the great uh, men of God, so to speak, and Israel at that time missed the coming of Christ. So they, there would probably be some sense of this. And so they, they would have understood from Malachi, they would have understood from Isaiah that when you see this prophet come, and a prophet indeed he was, then who comes next is the Messiah. And Jesus is saying, if you have ears to hear, you better hear it. The one standing in front of it's, you know, it seems to be that he's lifting up John, but really he's lifting up, uh, he's lifting up himself. Uh, truly, I tell you, and this is where the sermon gets good. Truly, I tell you, in case you don't figure it out on your own, I'll, I'll let you know. Truly, I tell you, when Jesus says truly, I tell you, what he means is that truly he tells you. So among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. It's a massive statement and then this one's even bigger yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he and so jesus is saying of all the old testament characters that you know about all the great men and women of god that you have ever heard about adam and eve abraham isaac jacob joseph uh, Moses, even King David, Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elisha, Elijah, all the mi major prophets, all the minor prophets, among all of them, John the Baptist is equal to or probably greater than any of them. That's a, that's a shocking statement. And, and it's because all of the prophets prophesied up to. Uh, the coming of Jesus. In other words, they all foretold or, or foreshadowed in some way the coming of the kingdom of heaven, including the kings, uh, for the Messiah. But John is the only prophet in history that wasn't just prophesying that the Messiah would come. He was the one that was prophesying that the Messiah had come. So his proximity to Jesus in the time that he existed in history and the incredible anointing he carried at a time when there was no anointing rose him to the top of the ancient people. Yet, at the same time, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What does that mean? Well, among those born of women, weren't we all, other than, well, actually Jesus was too, weren't we all born of women? So is that, so how can anybody be greater than Jesus? Does that mean the angels are greater than Jesus? No, those, those are John. Those who are greater than John are you and I. It, it's everybody after Jesus. Among all the people before Jesus, John the Baptist is equal or probably greater than, but even the least after Jesus, in his own words, is greater than even John. Those who are born of women are all of those who came before Jesus that maybe had the anointing of Christ, the spirit of Christ upon them, an extraordinary ability to understand and discern the ways of God, especially for their time. But those who were to come after, who were of the kingdom, 
are those who were born again in Christ. In other words, the day of Pentecost and every day after. Not simply born of the flesh, but born of the Spirit. What did Jesus say? You cannot see, you can't perceive, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again, born of the Spirit. Born not of uh, natural descent, as is the case, but also born of the Spirit. When we receive Christ, when we put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit has come upon us to give us that wisdom, kind of like the Old Testament characters. And the minute that we have that, that, that moment where we understand who he is and what he did for us, then we are washed in the blood of Christ and we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is a born again experience, born again in the spirit. And then, and only then, the anointing that we're on the, the Old Testament prophets, you might say, and on John, isn't simply on us, it comes alive in us. That's why the Bible says this is the day, um, we live in the day that the ancients longed for. Jesus in Matthew chapter 13, he said, he said you know, all the, all the ancients, all, all the great characters of the Old Testament, every faithful man or woman of God, uh, they long to see what you see, but they never saw it, and they long to hear what you hear, but they never heard it. And not only that, they long to experience what you experience, but they never fully experienced it. The infilling of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Spirit or the person of God, being reignited into the image of God is something that is extraordinary and was never experienced before the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And so now, this is what the prophets wrote about, is the day when we all know him from the least to the greatest. We're all his sheep. We can tune into his voice, every single one of us. We're the prophethood of all believers. We're the priesthood of all believers. Every member of missionary, like we're all in the kingdom in an extraordinary way. It's not just a few anointed kings and prophets and priests. It's, it's all of us. And each of us with a capacity to know God and a sensitivity to his spirit like, his, like that has never existed before. Now, you can read this as a status, which maybe it is, but I don't think it's a guarantee. If I were to rewrite the Bible, and don't get me wrong, I can't do that. If I do, then you should stone me. But if I were to rewrite this, I would write it this way. But I'm not really rewriting it. I'm just using this as an example. Please don't email me this week. I already know I'm wrong. You, yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is potentially, that's how I would, that's how I would state it, greater than he. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, you have a status, a born-again status that guarantees your entry into the kingdom of heaven. And so in a sense, it's already done. It is a status you have. It is a possibility that exists in you. It's very, very real. Uh, the, the spirit is willing, though, but the flesh is weak. But if you really want to walk in greatness, now I'm talking to a, a very small audience today, right? Because there's not many of you that really want to be great, right? Let's just keep it real. Status quo is okay with you, right? And if that's where you are, then heck, just be honest. That's where you are. Maybe you're in here today and you're like, man, I, ju I just need a paycheck. Greatness is not on the horizon yet. I'm, okay, sure. Nope. He'll meet you where you are. But if you want to be great, this is where you got to start listening. Everything I set up to now was just the introduction. This is the meat today. This is the important part. We have the potential for greatness we have guaranteed greatness as we enter into the kingdom of heaven. We have assurance. He who started the work will finish it. But I would say to you, it's a potential for greatness because greatness comes through the Holy Spirit that exists in us and letting that spirit rule and reign our lives. It's a lifestyle. It's, it, it, you could be great today, not so much tomorrow. That's me. Sunday's my day, Monday, not so much. But when we are sensitive to the Holy Spirit, submitted to the will of God, surrendered to God, at that moment where we know from the Bible, through prayer, by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the inspiration of God's love, what he's saying to do, and we do it, we enter into this place of greatness that the ancients longed for. This is about greatness. It's not about comfort. It's not even about success. 
It's about legend. It's about, the, it's about the image of God, the work of God, the mission of God on earth. Does this promise us riches and honor and opulence? Oh, no, no, no. It's quite ironic. I mean, it might lead to riches and it might lead to honor and it certainly leads to opulence in eternity, but there are no guarantees on earth. Matter of fact, Jesus is going to make that clear right here. Remember, the people are confused. If John is the greatest of anyone ever born of woman, and it, through faith in you, Jesus, eventually all of us can even be greater than him, and the Messiah is supposed to be ushering in the kingdom of heaven, shouldn't we be rich and powerful and awesome and beautiful and honored and the top of the crop? Why, why is that guy in jail? And Jesus explains that dynamic in the next verse. From the days of John the Baptist until now and beyond, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. This is, this is like an explanation of the times, and also, I would say, like a spiritual law in time. Faithfulness to God might bring you riches and honor. It really might. It might not, but guaranteed... Faithfulness of God guaranteed will bring you at a minimum persecution. You will offend. You will insult. You will be bringing in the, the holy power of God, the magnificent energy of the kingdom of God, and it will be opposed. In, in Luke, I think, chapter 16, uh, this verse comes off a little differently. It says uh, in some versions that the kingdom of God comes by force and it's forcefully opposed. It seems to be talking about this, this power coming from heaven that is being opposed by dark forces on earth. W whatever the case may be, he's, he's explaining spiritual warfare. And he's saying that everything that happens that is good, that is powerful, that is, eter that is eternal, not just some things, but everything is opposed. Everything. Like, do not be surprised when you go to achieve this greatness, so to speak, of, that comes through obedience and sensitivity of the Holy Spirit, the, the next thing that happens is you get socked in the nose. Like, don't be shocked by that. Guaranteed. I mean, there, there is not one time I pray for the church and God makes a promise, gives me a vision for the body, that the very next thing that happens in, in, in direct proportion to the greatness of the revelation is extraordinarily bad. Matter of fact, the days that I come to church and I'm like, man, I cannot wait. It's going to be a packed house. Everybody's going to be online. I got this great vision about the future, about how God is going to come upon us, bless us, establish us to do extraordinary things for him. That's the day like three people show up. I'm not even exaggerating. I think it's been that way. And then I'm like, man, it's going to take all the faith in the world to believe that God can do that through me and these three other people. I mean... It, if you go home and, and, and your, wife, uh, your husband um, is there and, and, and you're his wife and God is like, go in, be humble, serve him, love him, Ephesians 5 all over the place, no matter wh how big of a jerk he is, like he's going to be the biggest jerk that day than any day. And husbands, I got your back. It's not him, it's the devil in him. You always hear me say, it's not me, it's Christ in me. Well, except when it's the other guy, right? I mean, you're going to be opposed. That's at a, that's at a superficial level. You actually go to give your life to Christ? Your life, your lifestyle? Guaranteed persecution. Maybe riches, maybe honor, certainly power in some form, but no guarantee of success in the form of the world. It's ironic, and it's absolute. For every action in the kingdom of God, there's an opposite reaction. I've said this many times. And the action that comes from God absolutely swamps the power of the reaction but at the visceral level the reaction seems a hundred times um, more powerful than the power that God is bringing through us it feels like we're losing but then somehow we win we always feel like we're losing but somehow we win he's saying don't be surprised when John gets his head chopped off because he's about to and, and don't be surprised when I die on the cross because I'm going to be crucified. And don't be surprised when all of my most loyal followers don't end up running the government of Israel. 
But basically, every single one of them get martyred. Don't be surprised by that. Don't be surprised when you start the first church and it becomes a mega church in Jerusalem and everything seems to be going so well when the next thing that happens is persecution and, and dispersion of that church all over the ancient world. Don't be surprised because I told you in advance the coming of the kingdom of heaven meets massive opposition. It's ironic, it's terrible, and yet somehow God's will is done. All the nations who have persecuted the church through history eventually fell, but the kingdom of God, the church, marches on. But that path was paved with persecution and even the blood of the martyrs. Now, probably God is not saying to you today, if you want to be great, your life is going to be taken. He's probably not saying that. He could be saying that, but he's probably not saying that. But I can promise you this for sure. Your lifestyle will be taken. There's martyr in the sense of giving your life, maybe give it a capital M, but there's also martyr in the sense of giving your life and your lifestyle. If you're here today to get God to bless your lifestyle, this isn't a very good sermon for you. If you're here today to give your life to Christ and for greatness in the kingdom of God, then this sermon is for you. Sorry. That's just where we landed in the scriptures. I wanted to be nice. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah that was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Uh, what is he saying? Well, the Bible in the Old Testament, this is kind of a reiteration of what he said earlier, prophesied that the prophet would come to precede the coming of Jesus. And, and he would be Elijah, right? And so um, what he's saying is, you know, when the Bible said that Elijah would come to precede me, what it meant in a sense was John. He is an and Elijah, and then many of us believe before the second coming of Christ, this prophecy will be fulfilled as well, where actually Elijah, who was called up into heaven, remember in the Old Testament, and on the chariot, and he never actually died, um, will come back and be recognizable to the people and will prophesy before the coming of the Messiah too. What he's saying is, uh, he who has ears to hear, don't just hear what I'm saying about John, uh, recognize what that means about me. And even though the difficult circumstances that exist around John and that will exist around me and will exist around the apostles and will exist around you if you follow me, like don't base your experience based on your experience. Base your experience based on the word of God. Not on your emotion, not on what you thought it would be. You know, I, I think the secret to greatness is this. I'm not saying I've achieved it, but I think the secret of greatness is this. It's getting to the place where you fully accepted death. Like you're not afraid to die. Like you just can't be afraid to die. And I don't mean like you just can't be afraid to give your life mortally. As I said earlier, you're not afraid to lose your lifestyle or what you thought your life was all about. You've got to make peace with the worst of circumstances. I have a really interesting counseling uh, method. And when somebody comes to me, and I don't know if it's right, I probably should consult an expert because I could be messing people up. But if somebody comes to me and they're fearful about something and anxious, and this is what I do with myself, and, and afraid that something bad, I mean, whatever it is, there's just fear, there's anxiety, whatever, like instead of trying to comfort them and telling them it's never going to happen, don't worry, it'll be all right, Jesus loves you, this is just in your head. Like sometimes there's things people say to me that's truly like it's obviously paranoid. So, you know, we, we deal with that. But um, if somebody's fearing something, like I actually I kind of say, well, okay, we'll embrace that. What if it did happen? What do you do then? Like, make peace with that. If God came to me and said, you know, you got three months to live, could I make peace with that? If God came to me and he said, hey, pastor, you're going to lose your church. These precious people that show up and listen to you not going not gonna to come anymore. Can you be at peace with that? 
Your husband's never coming back. Your wife's never coming back. Can you be at peace with that? I'm worried I'm, I might lose my job. Well, maybe he wants you to lose your job. Like, you got to make peace with it. I mean, if it's his will, then it, it will happen. If it's not his will and you're walking according to the Spirit, then it won't happen. So I'm not being fatalistic. But I think the secret to greatness is just like, bring it on. And so you say to me, well, pastor, why in the world would we do this? What's the compensation? This guy gets his head cut off. You get crucified. They all get martyred. The church gets persecuted. In today's day and age, you, you're probably going to get canceled, right? Eventually, we're going to lose the ability to buy and sell, the Bible says, in, the, in, in, in Revelation, right? We're going to be so rejected as a class of people because we stand with fidelity to God's word. I mean, the Bible actually prophesies we've we got some tough days coming. We gotta, we're going to make peace with that. And so what's the compensation? What's the payback? Well, the Apostle Paul knew, you know, he said, look, if it's only for this life that we have hope in Christ, then we should be pitied over all people. I mean, you don't hear this in the church. I'm, I hope some of you come back next week. What was he saying to his audience? He's saying, in the short term, this is not a good deal. I mean, I had status. I had power. I was popular in Jerusalem. I was persecuting Christians with all this zeal. I had everything going for me. And then I met Jesus one day. I was saved by grace through faith, through my encounter with him. And my life has never been worse. I'm homeless. I'm destitute. Even the people I love and try to lead, that I lead into the faith, they always are mad at me. I had to write these horrible, mean letters to them, and they get, it's terrible. I mean, it's just terrible, and I'm going to be martyred at the end of it all, too. So he's saying, look, if I got this revelation, this is the secret to my greatness, I've accepted the fact that I'm going to go to Rome, and they are going to kill me. The secret to his greatness was he's ready to lay his life down. His lifestyle, his ambitions, his dreams. You know, the American dream is incompatible with greatness in the kingdom of heaven. When, when I uh, first became a Christian, um, it seemed like all the great men of God I knew were rich and honored. I'm from the South, you know what I'm saying? And I wanted to be like them. The guy that owned Waffle House owned the Ritz. His name was Bill Johnson. He was a born-again believer, and, and, and God just blessed him and made him rich, and everybody lauded him, right? Uh, I went to Florida State University, go Knowles, and the greatest man on that campus was no, not a guy who had a Ph.D. It was, it was a, the football coach, of course. And his name was Bobby Bowden, and he had faith, and that made all the recruits come to Florida State, and they won national championships, and he made tons of money, and he spoke at SCA, and he was just lauded uh, in, in this region over here it's he he's like a joe gibbs right i mean how cool i mean joe gibbs is awesome i mean I, these people i love them i mean i w i wanted to be like them and he had faith and he won super bowls and then he owned a nascar team can you have a better life than that and he's so generous and he shares his faith with everybody i'm not i'm not coming against these people but i'm telling you the day has come in this country where we are no longer a Christian country and your faith and fidelity to God's word is not going to lead to riches and honor. I'm convinced of it. We're going to be shut out of the economy. And that was a nice time and it was a gilded time and maybe in some strange way, riches and honor will come to us on earth before heaven for the purposes of God. I don't know the mind of God. I can't guarantee that though. Paul couldn't guarantee that either. But what we can guarantee is persecution and a huge cost. And ironically, what I believe is those of us who exist in times that are more dangerous to hold on to our faith actually will do more to advance the kingdom of God than those before us. But I come back to the point, what is our compensation? Well, Paul said it's eternal life, and I, I agree with that. I think there was a guy named Randy Alcorn who wrote this great book called Heaven. I may be quoting the wrong one. And he said, or maybe it was Bill Bright, but Campus Crusade, like maturity for a Christian is living for eternity, like really meaning it. 
like willing to leverage everything in the temporal for the eternal. Until you're ready to do that, you're not a mature Christian. And by the way, that's okay. We all have to mature. We all have to grow up. But you got to get to that place. But I'm not there yet, okay? Maybe when the kids get out of the house and I have to pay so many bills, I'll be there. I'm on, I'm on my way. But that's, that's a great barometer of your faith. How much are you living for eternity rather than right now? I mean, there's two ways to me to, to analyze your faith. One is to look at your checkbook where your money is there your heart is also and the second is just to look at your life where are my affections am i more excited about retirement or am i more excited about going to heaven am i more excited um, about what school my kids are going to get in or am i more interested in making sure they get into the kingdom of heaven think about it if you want them to go to harvard they're probably going to hell I'm not even kidding. I mean, they will indoctrinate them. They will brainwash them. They will laud them. They will help them make it to the highest realms of this world. If you want them to be great in this world, send them to Harvard. But if you want them to be great in the kingdom of heaven, maybe send them to Bible college. Now, if God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, inspires and leads them there, because I know a lot of wonderful people that have gone to Harvard to give them that experience so they can be a Daniel in Babylon at the right time, so be it. But that, as a parent, really shouldn't be our focus anymore. How many parents have poured out their treasure to send their kids to a school, and they get them home after four years, they don't recognize them, and all of their faith has been ripped away? That's the day and the age we live in. That's where we are. So what's the compensation? Well, there's eternal life, so we got that going for us. Kind of like Bill Murray and Caddyshack. Don't ever watch that movie. You're saints. But he said, so I got eternal life. I got that going for me. And then, and so what's the compensation now? I'll tell you what the compensation is now. This is the only compensation I can promise you. It is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when he is pleased with us. There is something so, it's like happened to me maybe three times. When I know that God is pleased with me, and I'm not just anointed, right, and powerful for his purposes, that's a, that's a place of compensation, and, and I'm not just set free from addiction and all the things that try to drag me down because of this great anointing that's on me, that's a compensation too. The anointing breaks the yoke, many different yokes. And, and, and there are times where the compensation is compensation, like that's storing up treasure in heaven, and sometimes he drops a little bit on that, of that on me on earth for his purposes, but there, there's sometimes material compensation, but like I said, you can't count on it, so don't want to don't make any deals. But what you can count on is that the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, lives inside of you, and as much as he can be grieved, he can also be pleased. And when the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you is pleased, and that is upon your heart, there is nothing better. It is, it is the ultimate narcotic. It, it makes you not care what the price was, what you paid, or what the future looks like. It gives peace and joy that surpasses all all understanding it breaks every yoke it gives you an extraordinary ability to handle whatever situation it is that you are in and it is a blessing that comes regardless of circumstance what did paul say his secret was to contentment that he can do all things whether he's incredibly blessed or incredibly poor good times or bad times he can do all things through christ who gives him strength i know that's kind of ethereal i know that's like intangible but that's what it is the spirit that existed in Jesus, the spirit that is Jesus, that was in the apostles, that was in Paul, that was in every great saint to come after Christ, now lives inside of you, and the strength they had to persevere, to endure, and finish the race, and go all the way home to him with peace and joy that surpassed all understanding, that can be yours too. Love, peace, joy, grace, goodness, power, the fruits of the Spirit and the ability to have influence over those uh, that God puts in our life. It seems intangible, but that's it. That's all I got to offer you. Uh, I can't promise you riches, and I can't promise you honor in this world, but I can promise it to you eternally in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so if you still want to be a Christian, we'll finish this. 
to what can I compare this generation? Jesus is speaking to the audience in front of him, recognizing that a majority of them are rejecting him and his message. Maybe that isn't true for us today, but it was for him that day. He said, they are like children. Uh, Again, this is all quoting prophecy. Jesus did this all the time. He did his ministry, by the way, almost entirely out of the Old Testament. Do you ever think about that? Some people think Old Testament, not, no good anymore. New Testament, now what's what we teach from? But Jesus did his ministry entirely out of the Old Testament. The apostles did their ministry entirely out of the Old Testament. If that was a separate dispensation of God's grace, I, I don't know why they would have been ministering out of the Old Testament so much. So those of you who understand what I'm saying, we can have a debate later. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. And he was talking about the rejection of God through the rejection of John and the rejection of Jesus. John came, as we're about to read, with severity and, and holiness and asceticism, and they rejected him. And Jesus came with love and mercy and kindness and accepted acceptance, and they rejected him. The dual nature of God, it may seem duplicitous, but it's the dual nature of God. God is loving, kind, humble, gentle, patient, and enduring, and yet severe, holy, and eventually wrathful, all at the same time. He's not schizophrenic, it's just the way he is. It's all happening all at the same time. That's how he is, Savior, and at the same time also Lord. For John came neither eating or nor drinking. He was no fun. John was no, you, no fun. I would have rather been Jesus' disciple than John's, at least right up till the end, right? And they say he has a demon. He was as religious as anybody, but he has a demon. They said the same thing about Jesus. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. I mean, he made wine at a party one time, and a bunch of it, really good wine. And they say he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He was, that was true. And then Jesus said, but wisdom is proved right by her deeds or by her actions or by her children, by the outcome, by the fruit. By their fruit, you shall know them. And so what is he saying? He's saying, you know what? You rejected the the aspect of God that is his severity and his holiness when you rejected John. You rejected the love and the kindness and the goodness of God when you rejected me. When you reject one, you reject the other. When you reject both, you reject God. And they were both equally rejected. And so the confusion in the church often today is, you know, we have churches like ours that seem to be more severe and holy. At least that's where we are in this season. And you have others that it's all love, all kindness, all acceptance all the time. And both of those things are, are equally true, but they're true at the same time. There was a Harvard professor, and I'll give him a little credit, one time that said that intelligence is the ability to hold two things that seem the opposite of each other in your head at the same time. And this is the dual nature of God. Jesus is the lion, and he is the lamb. He is the Savior, and he is the Lord. He is severe, and yet he is accepting. And we should be really, really happy that both aspects of the character of God exist within him because through that, that is the only way salvation is possible. We come to the loving part of God, Christ our Savior, to receive his work for us on the cross and gain his acceptance without merit through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how we receive salvation. And then we experience salvation, those of us who are now the greatest in the kingdom of heaven through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in direct proportion to our ability to submit to him as Lord. You may have salvation, but you're not experiencing salvation. Well, I gave my life to Christ. Well, did you? We know that you received that he gave his life to you uh, at the cross, but then did you go to the throne and give your life to him? Because when you went to the cross, you didn't just receive the blood, you received the Holy Spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit inside of you that gives you the ability, this extraordinary greatness that that was prophesied here by Jesus, um, to will and to act according to God and his good purposes. It is the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to be righteous in a way that isn't self-righteous, through sensitivity, uh, submission, surrender, and obedience to God's word. And so you, you have your salvation as a status, but is it your experience? Well, if Jesus is your Savior, but he's not your Lord, 
If you're willing to receive his love, but not his severity and his holiness, then the salvation you boast in is probably not something you're experiencing. At least that's what happens to me. But when I come boldly to his throne of grace in my time of need, with my conscience sprinkled by the blood, right? Because I, can't go, I don't have any right to approach a holy, holy God, even on my best day. And I submit before his throne and I surrender my life to him and he begins to speak and he begins to lead, then I have the salvation I boast in. Not necessarily riches and honor, but the indwelling, the infilling, and the pleasure of the Holy Spirit, his leadership, his strength, his peace and joy that surpasses all understanding. Do you want to experience the salvation you boast in? Well, Jesus can't just be lamb. He also has to be lion. The power, as I said a couple weeks ago, is in the holiness. We want his loving kindness. We want his forgiveness, but we also want his power. But to have his power, we have to seek first the kingdom of God and all of its righteousness, all of his commands for us personally on this earth before heaven to see those kind of outcomes. And so uh, you may say to me today, okay, well, pastor, you've preached a really long time. Um, Where's the application? The application is between you and God. You're a sheep, you know his voice. You're the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. If John knew how to figure God out, then you should too. And the application of any real teaching uh, should happen in an ongoing conversation between you and God when you leave this place. If you come here, you listen, you believe, and you receive, then the conversation needs to continue as you go home. Because God is saying something to you very personally and very precisely through his word today that isn't going to come through your pastor. It's going to come through your father by his son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you that both are abundant in here today. We thank you that we do have your forgiveness. We have acceptance that doesn't come through merit. It comes through faith. And so I I thank you for that, Lord, that we can come boldly to you. We can come confidently to you, even in our most broken uh, estates. We can come messed up as long as we come humbly and we come honestly before you. And so thank you and praise you. Uh, that we can come into the light as you are in the light and we can even see sometimes um, as we're exposed that our deeds just don't live up our our thoughts our hearts our words our actions are just incongruent with your word we thank you lord that we can have that invasive encounter with you and not receive condemnation but receive conviction and clarity and a clear word a phrase a line something we can do in response received you as savior and now we can follow you as lord something we can do in response not perfectly imperfectly but increasingly through time something we can do something you're telling us to do today and we can experience the salvation that we boast in lord i pray that you will continue this conversation in every mind and in every heart of every precious person who hears this message today and that the salvation that you desired for us that comes through faith in these words um I pray that it would be done. In Jesus' name, amen.